Chapter 1, Part 4, Behavioral and Cognitive Approaches. A lot of the research we will cover in this class involves the use of laboratory animals, especially rats and pigeons, as research subjects. Let's review some of the advantages, disadvantages, and ethical issues of animal research as outlined in Chapter 1. Here are some of the advantages of using animals. Subject effects, that is, when the subject changes their behavior because they know they're being observed, may be less likely. Uh, convenience is one of the advantages. And uh, I mean convenience both in the traditional sense, it's convenient that there are systems in place to care for laboratory animals that makes it easy, in a sense, for researchers to do research, and in the sense of psychological convenience, uh, uh, that is, availability. So just like a convenient sample of introductory psychology students uh, might be something that a researcher would use when they think that what they're studying uh, applies to all humans and it doesn't matter who's in their study, they take who's most accessible, uh, laboratory rats and pigeons are accessible in a similar way. Another advantage is better experimental control. Uh, it's better experimental control both of the environment, right? The animals don't leave the lab, so experimenters don't have to worry about attrition, and of experience. A laboratory animal's performance in an experiment is never affected by them pulling an all-nighter so they can submit a paper on time. It's never impacted by their emotional state after a breakup or anything like that. Another potential advantage is the comparative simplicity of laboratory animals. They tend to be simpler, both physiologically, neurologically, and behaviorally than humans. So it's at least potentially easier to study a particular process or phenomenon in isolation. Here are some disadvantages of using lab animals in psychological research. Some sophisticated types of learning are unique to humans. For example, chimps, parrots, whales, and other animals have all demonstrated language learning abilities, but those language learning abilities are definitely not the same as human language learning. Even for shared behavior, some processes are difficult to model with animals. For example, one of my research areas is probabilistic choice. For many questions about probabilistic choice, I could design an experiment for rats, pigeons, or humans. Those experiments would involve different methods, but I would get a similar end result. That is, I would be able to answer the question. There are lots of questions that I could use rats, pigeons, or humans to answer. However, another area I'm interested in is problem technology use, which would be much harder to study in non-humans. There are useful and good animal models of behavioral addiction, but I still don't think a pigeon will ever be addicted to social media. Even for shared behavior, we can't really know for sure whether or when we can generalize from animals to humans. For example, a few years ago, my students and I developed a pigeon slot machine analog, a procedure where pigeons' behavior resembles the behavior of humans gambling with slot machines. But were our pigeons acting more like recreational gamblers or like problem gamblers? The only way to know for sure is to use the results of animal experiments to try and predict human behavior. The ethical considerations for doing psychology research with animal subjects are similar, but not identical to those of using animal subjects for biomedical research. Regardless of what type of research you're doing, researchers and IACUCs, that's uh, Institutional Animal Care and Use Committees, must weigh the costs to the animals against the potential benefits of the research. Behavioral research with animals can have and has had benefits that can't be obtained from human subjects research. Now this doesn't just apply to potential benefits to individual humans. It can include benefits to animals. For example, research on canine behavior has been used to help uh, determine what are the best ways to train shelter dogs in obedience and in uh, 
other behavioral aspects to make those shelter dogs more likely to be adopted. And that benefits the dogs, it benefits the humans. Uh, so that research that couldn't be done with human subjects has a de definitive benefit to uh, conspecifics. There's also a lot of animal research that has broader benefits to society. For example, in Tanzania, there are hero rats that have been trained through a research intensive process to detect things like landmines uh, in the ground and malaria in sputum samples. The benefits of that research to society, of that behavioral research to society are pretty significant. One other point to make with uh, animal research is that researchers bear a much greater responsibility for laboratory animals' well-being than they do for their human subjects. They have an obligation to care for those animals uh, for their entire lives, and that obligation encompasses their veterinary and psychological needs. Often they must uh, provide enrichment for the duration of the animal's life. Another important aspect of behavioral or behaviorist psychology is the emphasis on external events. For John B. Watson, the first behaviorist, psychology is, or at least should be, a science. Since science only deals with observable events, Watson reasoned that therefore psychology should only deal with observable events, namely stimuli and responses. Watson was against the use of unobservable events as psychological data. This was in reaction to introspectionists who attempted to record and analyze people's verbal records of their stream of consciousness. Whereas Watson was against the use of unobservable events as psychological data, B.F. Skinner discouraged their inclusion in psychological theories. These are different arguments, but they're compatible with each other. Skinner wasn't disagreeing with Watson, at least not on this point. He was making a separate point. Namely, that unobserved phenomena or intervening variables can be dangerous for scientists because number one, they can't be, they can be confused with causes of behavior. Number two, in spite of the fact that they don't have any explanatory power. For example, suppose a wife tends to snap at her husband when she has a head headache. Now that's an observable event. It can be measured, let's say, by sinus pressure. The husband might infer an intervening variable like she's grouchy or she's mean. That would be unfortunate because the solution to the observable problem is a Tylenol, uh, which is probably much easier than the solution to the intervening variable problem that might be a divorce. Okay, so for B.F. Skinner, intervening variables make theories more complex. But for Neil Miller, intervening variables can make theories simpler. So for example, hours of deprivation might be a better explanation for water seeking behavior like licking than the drive or the intervening variable thirst. But there are lots of reasons an individual might need to increase the amount of water in their body. So water deprivation is one, salt intake is another, if you eat something salty, or evaporation if you're outside on a hot day. If a young child can say, I'm thirsty to their parent, the most appropriate response is to give that kid a cup of water, no matter what the environmental origins of that thirst are, right? It doesn't matter whether the kid is thirsty because he drank, he hasn't had any water in the last four hours, or uh, he just ate something salty, or he's been outside in the sun. Regardless, the appropriate thing to do is give the kid some water. In this case, the intervening variable thirst has predictive utility. It's useful because it saves the parent from having to do a bunch of parental detective work. For Neil Miller and for lots of scientists, uh, 
intervening variables are not something to be afraid of. There's something to think carefully about. And if you can use an intervening variable to make simpler predictions or better predictions, uh, then they have value. These slides were created by James E. Mazur to accompany the eighth edition of Mazur Learning and Behavior 2017. They were adapted by me, Liz Kayanka, in 2020 for Cal State East Bay's Psychology 310 Conditioning and Learning.